kick it off. We got a little breakaway series today with Ron Dunn. Welcome. Thank you. All right, guys, good morning. Well, as Chris said, we have a little breakaway series. Uh, Hutch's mother passed, and so uh, he's in Maryland. Um, and uh, it's a celebrative service. She, she, knew, she knew the Lord, so she, uh, she's, she's home, and we'll all be there before we know it, right? <laughs> all right, well, what we're going to do this morning is look at a, a couple things. Um, you know, in the basic training series, we spent two weeks asking the question, can we trust this? Can we trust God's Word? And... Uh, in week one, Hutch, Hutch made a very important and a, and a huge statement. And what he said was, if there's one thing we need to understand, it's this, that God's word is God's word. <laughs> and so in his word, we get insights on how he thinks. And more importantly, that's, how, that's where we get to know who he is, right? And so in Genesis 1, the Bible opens and it says, in the beginning, God created and we can talk about whether there's a pause between verse 1 and verse 2, and we can discuss a few things about creation. But for the most part, when we then read through our Bible, we can wrap our arms, or our arms around that. We can kind of wrap our minds around that. You know, there's a few question things. What's with the Nephilim? And Revelation has some interpretation. But for the most part, what God lays out in the Bible, we can wrap our, our arms around that. But have you ever thought about what was God doing before Genesis 1, right? Now, we get a little bit of insight. He created angels. One of those angels got full of himself and pulled a third of them away. They fell, and he threw them to earth as a holding tank. So we kind of get that. But, but, but before that, what was God doing? So look at your first verse um, on, the, on the key verse card. Psalm 90, verse 2. Before the mountains were born, and before you gave birth to the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So there's part of our answer. Before all that, what was he doing? He was being God. And so to begin to even think about that, we got to get quiet, right? <laughs> We got to sit down. We got to let our mind kind of mull over that. We need to think and reflect on it. We need to talk to him about it. But even when we do all that, our minds are kind of still too small to really wrap our, our, our understanding around it. But here's what God offers us Take a, go, go to your going deeper verse, pull it out, and look down to. Um, Third one down, Hebrews 11, verse 6. And without faith, it's impossible to please God because anyone who approaches him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who earnestly seek him. So here's what God offers. If you want to come to him, if you want to have a relationship with him, if you really want to get to know who he is, we have to start out with faith. We just, that's what it is. We decide that, yes. You exist. Yes, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. And he tells us if we'll do that, if we'll come to, if we make that decision to come to him in faith, he's going to reward every one of us who diligently seek him. And so what does diligently seek him look like? Well, it's time with him. It's time in prayer. It's time in the word. It's time getting alone. It's diligently seeking who are you? How do you think? What does it look like? And he gives us his word to help us understand who he is. So if you frame this up, there was God, right? Everlasting that way will be everlasting this way. There's God. And then at some point in time, he creates earth. And then years and years and years and years go on, and then it's your birthday. <laughs> and you come into existence on whatever year that was. And then it doesn't matter if you live to 30 or if you live to 60 or if you live to 90. Whatever time that is, I can't get a space small enough between my thumb and my index finger to indicate what that is, right? 
It's our time here is so short. Look at the second key verse. Oh, Lord, what is man that you take knowledge of him? This is Psalm 144, verse 4. What is man that you take knowledge of him? Or the son of man that you think of him? Man is like a mere breath. His days are like a passing shadow. That's all we are is a... In the light of everlasting to everlasting. This God who... Are you kidding me? We get a chance during this little time on our, our, on our planet, this little bit of time that we're here, we actually have the opportunity to get to know the God who is from everlasting to everlasting. Wow. And when you think in lines of that, why would we ever get worried about things on this planet when we know the person who made the planet, right? Why would we ever start worrying about what people think of you? You guys haven't been here long enough <laughs> for me to worry about what you think about. But at one point in time, I couldn't even get up and hold a microphone because I was too worried about what people would think about me. And it was only until I got alone before God and realized, all right, I'm starting to realize who you are and really who I am. And therefore, because of that, my audience is really you. And now I can live life like that. But I can't get to know you more unless I'm spending more time with you in two ways, in prayer and in his word. That's what he calls us to do. And so let's touch on prayer for just a second. How's your prayer life? What does that look like? And what are you praying about? Jesus tells us we ask anything according to the Father's will, he is going to do it. Do you know when you're praying in his will? And do you know when you're just begging for something? <laughs> you're just wanting something, right? If you haven't done this already, on the back of, we're going to get to a little cool exercise here in a minute. But, um, oh, wait, I got it. Uh, on the back of that sheet that has the boxes on it, we don't have time to go through all these this morning, but spend, I'm going to encourage you to this week, spend some time on this. Take a look at how Paul prays. He gives us a template of what our prayer life, what our communication with God should look like. Let's look at the first one. I ask that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, and what is the surpassing greatness of his power toward us who believe. Do we pray like that? That that's what we're praying for, that he enlightens our heart, that we know no matter what we're facing today, no matter what angst we have in our life for this coming month or this coming year, whatever portion of life that we're, you want to look at, do we know the surpassing greatness of this God that we serve? Do we know that we're talking to a God who from everlasting to everlasting has been there and is there and is in total control and decided to create all of his creation and for some reason decided to put you on it and put me within it? Do we really slow down enough to put ourselves into that frame to realize that? So look at the third key verse, on, uh, and it's Colossians 1, verse 16. I'm going to suppose that probably half of us get half this verse, and half of us don't get the other half of this verse. All right, so here's what it says. For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. I suspect that most of us know that God created everything. All things were created through him and for him. That's the half that I didn't get for a long, long time. The fact that God created me for him. Do you realize that God in this little, <laughs> when he, on your birthday, when he decided to put you here, that he created you for him. That's why we're here, 
for him. Everything that he does within our life is to draw us more toward him. That little one breath that's described, that's our life, that's for him. And so do we view ourselves that way? Do we realize that we're here for him? Yeah, we have a job. Yeah, we have a family. But we were talking about family. What's our role in family? To teach him, to speak of him when we rise up, when we lay down. Share our story. Share what God's doing in our life. So why? So when they leave, they're starting another family that honors, worships, glorifies him, lives their life for him. Is that what we're doing? We have opportunity within our world, within our reach, to to be light, to be salt. This earth has no flavor without a Christian. This earth has absolutely no light without people who know God, who live with God, who honor God, who bow to him, who get to know him more. That's our role. That's our opportunity. We're actually created for him. And so he wants us to be in his word, to get to know him more. In the web letter I shared, um, in my reading, I came across 2 Chronicles 18. (laughs) I remember when I first came to know the Lord, I would come home and my parents would be watching TV, and I would say, how do they have, to, why do they waste their time doing that? They're watching some goofy game show. Or they're watching some whatever it was at the time, right? <laughs> picture television back then, picture today. I'm telling you, whatever excitement, whatever entertainment that you're searching for when you're just channeling, not even knowing what you're looking for, you're just saying, tell me what to do. <laughs> you can get that right here. Just read it. So Second Chronicles 18, it's the story of Jehoshaphat and Ahab. Two kings, right? Now, if you go back one chapter into chapter 17, you figure out who Jehoshaphat is, king of Judah, the, the, the kingdoms divided. His dad's name was Asa. It tells us that Asa was a good king. He actually started cleaning out idols. He was bringing Judah back to worship God. And then he got a foot infection. And so he went to physicians And the foot infection kept getting worse. And then it says, because he did not pursue God, he did not ask God for healing, the infection continued to get worse, and he died. So here's a good guy, a good king, who was doing all the right things. He gets ill, and instead of going to the God, he got caught up in something and and trusted just in the physicians. And God said, no, it's not going to cut it. (laughs) And so he'll just let him die. Wow. (laughs) Now, I remember when I was sitting right there going to the physician, but all you laid hands on me. (laughs) And the doctor then said, I have an impossible explanation. I don't know how this could have possibly happened. If we hadn't done that, would I be here? I'm not so sure. (laughs) I'm not so sure. (laughs) But I do know this. He wants us to go to him with prayers like these, Paul, these prayers of Paul that we're asking him that he be glorified with our life, that his will be done, that we get in line with that, that our eyes be open, that that's the type of relationship that we have with him. So Jehoshaphat, he, um, he becomes king, son of Asa. And so it says he's a very good king. And he has a goal, he has a vision that he's going to, for the first time in years and years and years and years and years, get the two kingdoms to get along together. So he offers his son to marry Ahab's daughter. Ahab's the king of Israel. So if you go to 1 Kings chapter 17, is it? No, 22. 1 Kings 22, it tells you the story about Asa. If you go back one chapter, you can kind of frame up what's going on with him or with Ahab. You know who Ahab's wife was? Jezebel, right. So in the, in the chapter before, Ahab's out walking. He sees a vineyard. He goes, man, that's a nice vineyard. I want that vineyard. Naboth owns that vineyard. He says, goes to Naboth, say, Naboth, I want your vineyard. I'm going to put my vegetables in here, and I will pay you whatever you want for this, or I'll give you a vineyard better than this one. And Naboth says, can't do it. <laughs> this is my inheritance. This vineyard's been in my family forever. I don't want to give up this vineyard. So Ahab goes home. He's on the sofa. Jezebel comes home. 
what is wrong with you? <laughs> Why are you sulking? He said, oh, I wanted his vineyard, and he wouldn't give it to me. And she says, that's no way for a king to have. Get up. So she says, I'll take care of this for you. So she constructs a letter, puts his seal on it, sends it out, tells the governor of that city to throw a big feast, put Naboth at, the, at one of the head chairs, and then during the feast, have some people come in and accuse him of treason, accuse him of saying things against Ahab, and then take him out and hang him. So they do that. She comes back home and says, the vineyard's yours, Naboth's dead. So he goes out to the vineyard. God tells Elijah, I want you to go meet Ahab. He's in that vineyard right now, and I've got a message for him. So Elijah goes to meet Ahab. Ahab sees Elijah coming and says, hey, my enemy. <laughs> Ahab says, because you took this man's life and stole his vineyard, here's what God's going to do to you. Dogs are going to lick your blood out of your chariot. Your wife's bones are going to be broken in the streets and the dogs are going to eat her. And your downline will not rule in Israel. Your, your kingdom will not be sustained. Well, Ahab gets so shook up, he goes home, he puts on sackcloth and ashes. And then God says, Elijah, look at him, man. He's just like, he really got, he may be getting a message. Let's just slow the roll a little bit and let's just see what happens, right? So now we're three years later in the next chapter. It says it's three, it opens up, it says three years later. And now this whole thing's coming with Jehoshaphat gives it. They're having a big feast. And Ahab looks at Jehoshaphat, his neighboring king, and says, hey, this is a good time. We don't have much war, but the Ramians have taken Ramath Gilead from me, and I let them have it for a long time. Will you join me in war against them? Let's get that back. Jehoshaphat says, hey, we're like one now, so yeah. Well, maybe we should consult the Lord first and see if that's what he wants us to do. And so Ahab brings in 400 prophets, and they immediately all say, victory will be yours. And so Jehoshaphat says, hmm, is there a prophet of the Lord that we can ask? Because you got a bunch of yes men here, right? And so he said, now he didn't mention Elijah. Elijah's still alive. Didn't even mention Elijah. But he says, there's one guy that we could consult, but I hate that guy. <laughs> Every time he prophesies, he prophesies wrong and, and bad toward me. And so Jehoshaphat says, that's no way for a king to talk. <laughs> Bring him here. So while they're getting him, all these other prophets are dancing around and telling him they're going to have victory. The messenger says to Micaiah, hey, all the other prophets are, are seeing victory you tell him victory as well. Micaiah says, I'm going to tell him what the Lord tells me. <laughs> so when he gets there, Ahab asks the question. Micaiah says, yeah, go ahead. That's what you want to hear. Go ahead. You're going to win. And he says, tell me what God's really telling you. So he said, if you go, you're dead. And so Ahab looks at Jehoshaphat. He says, I told you. I told you that's all this guy says. All night. He's Mr. Negative. <laughs> so he said, throw him in jail. And keep him there, only feed him bread and water until I come back. And Micaiah says, well, if you come back, that means I didn't hear from the Lord. Meanwhile, one of the other, other, other prophets came up and slapped him in the face and said, why do you think you know God's word and not me? And all Micaiah said was, mark my words. Well, they go to battle. Watch this. Ahab, so slick, he tells Jehoshaphat, you put on the robe of a king. Because he knows the, Ra the Arameans are going to come after the king. For victory. So he says, you wear the robe of the king. I'm going to be disguised like a soldier, and let's go to war. I'll encourage the guys from, the, from here, but you be, the, you be the standing emblem. Well, the Aramean king says, go after King Ahab. So they see Jehoshaphat, and they just start going after him. He realizes they're coming after him, so he cries out to God. He pushes the reset button. He rebalances. He rekindles. He says, Lord, help me. And they've suddenly realized it's not Ahab. So one soldier turns around and throws an arrow into the air, randomly up in the air. The arrow comes down, and in the seam of Ahab's armor, the arrow goes and penetrates through. And he looks at his right-hand man and says, I've been hit bad. Get me out of here. He dies in the chariot. He bleeds out. They take the chariot back, and the dogs lick up the blood. 
three years later. Now, why watch TV when you can read stuff like that, right? <laughs> but what's the point of it? What's the point of it? Look at the last key verse. Or do you think the scripture says without reason that the spirit he caused to dwell in us yearns with envy? Is this a crazy thing for God to say? That he is jealous for us. That he actually yearns for envy, with envy to be with us. That's how God feels toward us. When we, I was sharing with the table leaders last week, we finished up our convention, and it was great, but it was morning to night. But it was, in reality, we got as much energy back from our members and the suppliers that came to our convention as what we gave to them. But we're exhausted when it was done. And it, was I praying during a convention? Of course. Did I have time alone with God during a convention? No. <laughs> I was either sleeping or moving and shaking hands or speaking or whatever it was, right? I couldn't wait to get back home again and get in my chair and just get quiet before God and say, I love you. Thank you. Where are we going? <laughs> what do you want to do? And you know what? He'll meet us there. He honors that. He, I, what I came to realize is he wants that as much with me, he wants that as much with you as I could ever with him, and more so. That's the God that we serve. That's his heart. This God who we get insights of, this God who we get to know through Scripture, that's his heart. He wants us with him. He wants us to shut things down and just get with him and concentrate with him, just be still with him. And then absorb his word. So I have to ask you, where are you at in your study with the word? This week, I was almost like a little kid. This showed up in the mail. I was listening to David Wilkerson, who's now deceased, but in it, in it he said, you know, as we get closer and closer to the end times, as you get older and older and life gets harder, it becomes more and more important that you absorb the Psalms. So this book is nothing but Psalms. And so what I've now committed to do is during part of my chair every day is to absorb a Psalm. And in that, relearn God's love and different dimensions of God's love. And what are the Psalmists singing about and saying? And from their deepest relationship with God. What insights are they giving us about this God who we're getting to know more and more all the time? And then where are you at? Do you have, I mean, <laughs> I remember when, I, when we lived in Wisconsin, I, I, I never was a handyman around the house and, and, I, and I started playing baseball with a guy who was, right? And so he came over to do something that is, if I told you what it was, it's so simple, you'd probably laugh at me, but, but <laughs> he came over, he had this tool belt on and he knocked it out like that. And I looked at him, I said, man, I could have never done that in, in two hours, let alone 10 minutes. And he said, you got to have the tools, man. <laughs> and it was true. We have to have the tools. So let me ask you, what's your tool, what does your tool belt look like? Do you have a Bible that you absolutely love? We're talking about can we trust this Bible? <laughs> can we trust it to, for, to help us get to know God? Absolutely, yes. So what does your toolbox look like? I have up here, and you guys, if you don't have a Bible you fell in love with, you're welcome to take one. Uh, if you can help us out in the back, great. If not, it's a gift for yours. So, so here's some various tools, okay? I don't know if you're familiar with a Dake Bible. If you want a Bible that you can absolutely pour into and study, that gives you great thoughts and great leads and great, well, how to take this and connect it with that, Dake Bible will, do that, will help do that for you. It's a great study Bible. Here's an inductive study Bible. I think this one is, it's ESV, okay. So this will also help you topically look at things. As you're reading the Bible, just connect certain, certain points one to another. Um, here's one that Gail gave me early on when we first started getting together. Read the Bible chronologically in a year. Start when any time you want to start, but it'll take you, and it'll, it'll take you chronologically so that you're getting the timeline of when things absolutely, actually happen, but you've got a reading schedule so that one year from now you can say, I've read the entire Bible. If you do that one, I'd mark it up like crazy. Look for IMAX moments, square them, places you can come back to when you have more time to dig into it even deeper. Just let the Holy Spirit guide you through that. 
And then this is the one that Ryan's using now, Every Man's Bible. It's the New Living Translation. It's an easy read. It helps you get the stories quickly, and it has some side notes to help your sleeping brain sometimes <laughs> realize what it is that, that God is talking about in this section. And the other thing I got excited about this week when my psalm showed up was I also ordered myself a new little travel Bible. This is just the New Testament, and it's Psalms and it's Proverbs. But one of the things I want to do this year is read more about Jesus' life. And so I'm carrying this with me. And instead of looking at Fox News' next update about something that doesn't really matter, <laughs> or CNN or whatever news app I've been checking out while I'm on the throne room, I'm, using, I'm, I'm done doing that. <laughs> Why not fill that time? So what I'm saying to you guys is come up with a plan that, you, that part of the reason why you can't, get the, you can't wait to get into that room is you're being proactive, and you really do want to open the word, and you can't get to, wait to get to the next part. And sometimes you just stumble ac ac across stuff, but God's going to surprise. Remember what he said. If we come to him with faith and we diligently seek him, He's going to reward us in ways that we can't even imagine. All right, so we're going to send it to the tables, and what we're going to do for the, what you're going to need to do for question number one is pair up with somebody. So this is a collaborative exercise, okay? One person is X, and one person is O, okay? The point is get as many points as you possibly can. Now, here's how you score a point. If you take a corner, you already got a point. Because as many rows, either straight up and down, east and west, north and south, or on an angle that you can line up where there's no break, where there's all O's, there's all X's, that gets a point. Okay? So you got three minutes to do it. It's an exercise in which you want to get as many points as possible. And I would recommend that you start out with a corner. One way you can do it is just go X, O, X, O, okay? So one person's X, one person's O, and away you go. Score as many points as you can, and then move on to the second question. Table leaders, you got it. Thank you. let's go to that crazy little exercise you did, right? Um, did anybody here get 14 points? <laughs> 10? <laughs> how many did we get back here? 15, 14? Uh, yeah, we have to check that. The, ma <laughs> the max you can get is 22 points, 11 each. So it's a line of unbroken. So, uh, you know, here, here's, here's the whole point of that thing, okay? Number one, did you, big question, did you look at it together to figure out how you both could get as many points as possible, or did you go into competition mode? <laughs> All right, so, so I'm going to take you back. I'm going to take you back to what I said. What I said was this was a collaborative exercise, right? And I said the point was to get as many points as possible in a collaborative exercise. So, and the whole point of this whole silly thing is this. Why, we were talking about our time in God's word. We're talking about developing your spot, your chair, your place to get away, your time. Why do we need to do that? Because you can't even show up at a men's group on a, on a Friday morning and not have competition come out of you, right? <laughs> when you're told not even to be competitive. So look at this, this thing in James chapter 4. 
What causes conflicts and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the passions at war within you? You crave what you don't have. You kill and covet. You block the other person from getting points, but you're unable to obtain it. <laughs> you quarrel and fight. You don't, have, you don't have because you don't ask, and when you do ask, you don't receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may squander it on your pleasures. Yeah, we need God's word. We need God's word to help us recalibrate because that's who we are. We can't help that. <laughs> unless the Holy Spirit indwells us, unless we give the Holy Spirit something to work with by infusing ourselves with truth, with God's word, getting to know him and how he thinks, we're constantly at odds. So do we realize how desperate we are for truth? Do we realize really how desperate we are to get in line with what he says in his word, that we have to have this as a base so that we know how to think, we know how to operate. Because left to ourselves, we're gonna go off in a whole nother direction. And by the way, you can say, you know, I'm gonna, one thing's great, I'm gonna keep coming here. Do you realize you couldn't even remember the instructions I gave you? <laughs> so it's very humbling for guys like Hutch and for me and for Chris and Jeff, whoever else speaks because we spend a lot of time doing it, but half of it you don't hear anyway. <laughs> I mean, that's just the nature of it. We're thinking about something else. We're doing something else. You can't remember on Sunday what was even said, have most of it. And so, yeah, we're here for encouragement. Yes, we're here for recalibration. But, guys, you have to be in the Word. It has to be you, God, His Word together, studying and swallowing this and absorbing it and giving Him something to work with. Take a look at the end of this verse. You adulteresses. Why did James call us that? Here's Jesus' brother who really got, I mean, this guy got jolted. When Jesus came back and appeared to him, he's like, I missed it the entire time. You really are the Savior. And he became one of the most influential leaders of the early church and why we're all here today. That's how the Holy Spirit used him. That's how God... And so here's what he says to us. You, why would he call us adulter? What's, adul what, what's, what's an adulteress? <laughs> yeah, if you're committing adultery, what you're basically saying is my wife no longer satisfies me. I need something more. I need something in addition to her. What Paul is saying is that if we're looking to the world to fulfill us, if we're saying there's something else that I need besides my relationship with God, my time in his word, my prayer with him, my growing love and walk with him, you're an adulteress. You're looking for pleasure outside of this God who puts you here, the everlasting to everlasting God who gave you a birthday and created you and gave you this breath for a period of time but during that period of time, wants the relationship with you, wants you to get to really know him and then live with him forever in eternity in gratitude. And so let's look at the rest of that verse from James. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever chooses to be a friend of the world renders himself an enemy to God. Wow. Wow. I would say the last thing on this planet I would want to be called is an enemy to God. I don't want enemies. <laughs> now, I look around this room, and I can see four or five guys that could probably beat me up together, you know. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I don't want enemies because enemies can do bad things to you, right? How about being an enemy of God? This is what James tells If you're in love with the world, you're an enemy of God. So what is keeping you from, from doing this? What is keeping you from getting a Bible that you love and absorbing it and just concentrating on him and spending time with him and really opening up your communication with him? What's keeping you from it? Something is. Identify it. Lay it down to him. Beautiful thing about our God is not only does he tell us what to do, he gives us a helper to do it. What more can we ask than that? Gail shared with me a, uh, a really cool set of verses, and I'll, I'll close with that. Look, look at this. Here was Paul's mission. 
Once Paul got converted, he caught fire. All that passion he had to do right, and he thought he was doing right by trying to squelch the church, when Jesus showed up and said, Paul, why are you persecuting me? And he realized he was on the wrong team, and God called him to the right team. He turned all that passion around. And here's what he said. Here's what his mission. Him we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling, struggling with all his energy, that he powerfully works within me. So uh, two questions. Is that our mission here at One Thing? I'm not so quick to answer that. I'm not so quick to say, yeah, that's our, definitely our, always our focus. Our mission statement is to, is to spur men on to a closer walk with God. I would like to say that we're so pinpointed, we're, walk, we're marching step by step with Paul. But I, I promised Gail that I would chew on this for a while. <laughs> and together as a leadership team, we'll talk about this for a little bit and see you know, what else or what can be sharpened. But let me ask you that personally. Is this your mission? To gain all wisdom. <laughs> to present yourself mature in Christ that you know the power and the energy of the Holy Spirit inside you and you're grabbing onto that and you're living with that, that you know what works within you. The only thing that stops that is just something you're hanging on to because you just want to hang on to it and you don't want to give it up with God. So if you know what that is, give it up. <laughs> give it up. We're here for a breath and we're done. And we got, I mean, hey, this place, I think life can be fun and I think life can be downright knock us to the dirt. Right? I think life can be very exhilarating, but life can also be extremely burdensome. And I don't know how to get through life, and I don't even know how to get balance in the fun of the life unless I'm here. <laughs> because that's, that's what this, that's what that, and you can't replace your personal relationship, your personal growth. And so wherever you are with it, I'm just asking you to pick it up. <laughs> What's that? Christmas song, it just came to my mind. Come on, jingle horse, pick up your feet, right? <laughs> so is that what you need to do? I don't know. I don't know, but, but you do. So I'm just saying, ask God to help you fall in love with his word. Read it in an exciting way. Get the right tools. Have the right tool belt and invest time there. All right, guys, appreciate you immensely. Close at your table, and we'll see you next week. Thanks. One Thing for Men meets at Cabernet Steakhouse in Alfreda, Georgia on Friday mornings from 7 to 8 a.m. If you live in the Atlanta area or visit the area on Friday, we would love to have you join us in person. And if you have been blessed by this message, please consider supporting One Thing for Men online.